full access to RFR only on Patreon. Become a member of the RFR Patreon community to get more Rebel Force Radio. Bonus shows and content are available right now only at patreon.com slash rebel force radio. Begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Well, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was talking about this great birthday gift that Jimmy Max sent me, these wonderful Star Wars logo coasters. And he said, well, I included the business card of the guy that, that makes these. these. These coasters are great. They're actually made out of like a, like a, like a tile, like a subway tile. And uh, they're all black, kind of a shiny, glossy black with... Uh, there's four of them in the set. You got the uh, the Jedi Order logo. You've got the Rebel insignia. Uh, you have the Imperial Cog, and then you have the Resistance logo. And uh, anyway, I found the card. I was actually I was digging through some old show notes, and all of a sudden, boom! The card popped out. And we promised we'd give this guy a, a, a plug, but it's a Roman Danalo. He's the guy that's making these. I hope this doesn't get him into trouble. But anyway, uh, you can find him at Etsy. Uh, he's got a shop there, which uh, proves once again Jimmy Mac uh, shopping on Etsy. Hey, uh, <laughs> should I be insulted? I don't even know. Uh, Etsy dot com slash shop slash rooms by Roman. You can find those great Star Wars logo coasters for your cantina bar uh, right there, and you want to check those out and. Uh, uh, they were very cool. Check those. Uh, anyway, great to be with you. Great to be here. Rebel Force Radio this week's show for October 12, 2018. Uh, hot on the heels of the premiere of Star Wars Resistance, the third. Well, I guess it's not really the third. It, it's, it's the third in the Filoni verse, we could call it. But certainly not the third Star Wars television or animated series. We have the Ewoks and Troids, if you can count those. But we are certainly fresh off the premiere of Resistance. We've seen a number of episodes, so we'll be talking about that, all of that later in the show, as well as uh, rumors abounding about Star Wars Episode Nine, plus a few thoughts about The Mandalorian, John Favreau's live-action TV series set to debut next year on the Disney streaming surface, uh, service. All that and a whole lot more. So you want to stick right here for the best in Star Wars news and analysis to be found anywhere in the galaxy and here to help me do all that and so much more the aforementioned my good friend and yours from chicago jimmy mack hey jason hey star wars fans i dig filoni verse i like that mm. i like how that encapsulates the three series clone wars rebels and resistance all series which dave filoni has had a hand in up to this point. So the animated Filoni verse, when you're talking yeah. Star Wars, are those series. But obviously, we've had other animated series. We've had the Droids and Ewoks, Adventure Hour, or whatever the hell they called that in the <laughs> 80s. And then we had, uh, well, the micro series. Yes, that's for, right. Right. Directed by Gendy Tartakovsky for yeah. the Clone Wars. It was just Clone Wars. No, right. the. Yeah, who's a little bitter, by the way, and I don't necessarily blame him. I'm not picking on the guy. I, I, my God, I, uh, yeah, I love Gendy from you know Dexter's Lab and Samurai Jack and uh, uh, the work on Johnny Bravo and some of those great Cartoon Network shows. But, but Jim, we've had some uh, opportunities to share some quotes and some uh, follow up stories in the in the aftermath of that that series and it sort of being uh, written off and sort of out of canon seems to have uh, put Gendy's nose slightly out of joint. Well, I, you know, 
I'm familiar with the interviews in which Tartakovsky has talked about his time with Lucasfilm. And I wouldn't say that he's like ticked off or miffed necessarily. Uh, probably disappointed more than anything. Okay, I'll buy that. Because obviously he's had a career that's been uh, very fulfilling for the guy. He's had uh, quite a few successes from which to hang his hat on. So I don't think he necessarily would be kind of cranky about it, but maybe he just knows, hey, you know, in the business, some sometimes that's how the ball bounces. And, uh, of course, he seemed very into doing Star Wars and was all on board. And there was talk about expanding the Star Wars galaxy into animation as early as... 2002, 2003, when Tartakovsky signed on to do those micro series shorts for Lucas. But that all kind of just disintegrated a little bit. I, I don't know how. I, I don't know how things come into play. George Lucas, of course, being the main creative of all this, also while being the guy who runs the entire company, that, uh, you know, I, a lot of things I think. Um, sort of just shifted in the wind. And we've heard story after story about how George Lucas would just walk in one day and start laying out a game plan that was completely opposite the game plan everybody had been working on for the last several months. And he just would always act like, well, yeah, that's just the way it is. That's <laughs> what? What, you don't know this? But, yeah. you know. Like, well, I, I think when it comes to the Gandhi series, that, that, was, that was really just, uh, that was an experiment for George. It was an experiment. Yeah. He's, and when you got that kind his, of money. <laughs> right. He's dipping yeah. his toe into the water. Right. You got a guy like Gendy who's a you know, lifelong fan and, you know, and, and, and believes at the time he's making some real contributions to Star Wars canon and the, the legacy and all of that and breaking new ground. And then, you know, Lucasfilm kind of just sort of glosses over it and like, well, we're going to do our own thing. You know, we're going to do something better. I think at the time there was thought that that would have developed into a, a regular series. I think there there was I, I think that was probably on the table, and right. then he decided to just open up his own animation studio. And the, yes, yes, and the potential for it was certainly there. Well, it did open up the door for some voice talent to jump on board. Then, with Star Wars guys like James Arnold Taylor, definitely uh, got his feet on the ground as far as being the voice of Obi Wan by 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 voicing the character in that show and everything. So, but you know what? Forget the past. Let's look forward to the future, to Star Wars Resistance. We're going to break down the first episode on this show. You, you know, Jason, there are three episodes out there now. That's and, what I've heard. Yeah. I've heard. Now, if you if you count the the first episode, which would be like the, the 40 minute or, you know, double episode. Right. That's episode one. And then there were two additional episodes that were released uh, to the streaming uh, outlets like Hulu and the Disney app. The right. current Disney app. Right. right. Uh, I didn't make I, I, it through all three. I didn't get it through all three. I, I got to confess. I saw the first one, you know, what we would call the pilot episode one. And then I saw about half of the second one. And, uh, you know, I watch on my drive to work. So I, I, I need more <laughs> commute a, time. The most dangerous way to consume <laughs> your Star Wars entertainment, ladies and gentlemen, mm. is uh, when you're, you're, you know, in charge of driving the, your own sand crawler home, you know. They would even yeah. let the Jawas do that. <laughs> I mean, come on now. But so for such a momentous event as a brand new Star Wars animated series being launched, we've brought in a special guest, Star Wars brother Billy Mac. All Hi. right. <laughs> Hi, you kids. All right. All right. Hey, well, hey, real quick, real quick, before the show gets any deeper, just say something yeah. as Lando just so we can, uh, you know, ease the tension and move forward. Well, I thought you said they'd be left in the city under my supervision. Oh, it's just like Billy <laughs> really D. Williams okay. is here with Are we is. good? Are we good? Yeah, we're good. We're fine. We are we're fine. good. We are. It's always good All when right, Billy now. Mac is in studio, especially when he brings uh, Billy D. Mac with him. But, uh, yeah, we got so much to talk about. Uh, we, we, last week on the show, a big part of our discussion, of course, was uh, the reveal of uh, John Favreau's uh, live-action TV series to debut next year on the Disney streaming service. And uh, we, got a, we were greeted with a description of the series, a title of the series, and our first production photo. 
And certainly, uh, those of you out in uh, Rebel Force Radio land uh, came back with uh, your opinions on our opinions. And we got this message. Uh, this is from uh, Frankie. He's in Manchester in the U.K., and he says, love the, sh- love the show. Always save it for Sundays to end the week on a high before Monday begins. Just picking up on what you said about Django Fett in the last episode, was very interested to learn Django himself was not Mandalorian because according to 2002 Star Wars Bounty Hunter, available on Xbox and PS2, Django had a Mandalorian mentor called Jasper Mareel. Jaster. Story- Jaster. Jaster? Oh, Jaster. Okay. All Jaster right. Jaster Mareel. Uh, and Jasper sounded like a, a you know more real name, but Jaster that, that's that's more Star Warsy. Jaster Moreal. This story originated as an EU comic, but his name is mentioned in the game a few times, and it also includes the origin of the Slave One ship as his inherited Mandalorian ship from Jaster. Oh, I remember that. On one of the level. Bill, you played the I game. I played that game many times. Yes, I loved okay. it. Okay. Yeah, that came he, out yeah, around the time of episode 2 and I I played that through many times. That was like I that was kind of a return to video games for me for a while. Star I, I got, Wars Bounty Hunter. Yeah, on the on, Xbox. Uh, Nintendo GameCube. Oh, all right. Yeah, yep. There were a couple the, the of Star GameCube. Wars games and that one I just was like so sucked into it. It was so cool. It had you now, know the voices uh Tim Morrison and uh uh Zam Wessel. Oh, excellent. What what, what was who who played Zam? <sighs> Kind I met her once too. Oh, I can't. I can't think of Leanna. Le- yeah, Leanna. Kind of a long last name. Something with a W. Oh, not yes. Leanna Rhymes. We- no, West- I've, I've met uh, Walsman. I think Wal- Leanna Walsman. Wal- oh, yeah. okay. That sounds right. That uh, sounds right. I, uh, I I met Leanna uh, once at uh, Star Wars Fan Days <laughs> in Dallas and uh, interviewed her, and uh, she was fabulous. What what a, what a great. Uh, I think she was a New Zealander, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, you yeah. know, fantastic personality, and someone I wish oh. was more readily available to convention goers here in the states because you don't really see her name out there signing as Zam Wessel too often. At least I haven't, and uh, like at a Star Wars celebration, you know, it would be great to have Zam Wessel there. You know, she'd be shooting darts at people as they're walking by, <laughs> dropping like flies. I just what kind? What kind of dart? Time. What kind of dart? A Camino saber dart. <laughs> but that, and then that game also had a character named Montross, who yes, I think was Mandalorian too. I, Montross. See, I forget Montross. Yeah, and he was voiced by uh, Clancy Brown. In the game, oh, yeah, oh. Mr. Krabs, mm-hmm. <laughs> I always remember him as Viking from the movie Bad Boys with Sean Penn. Oh. Those of you who, <laughs> oh my gosh, no way, was yeah. he in that? Yeah, Viking. Oh, oh my gosh, and of course, uh, more recently, Star Wars fans he meets kind Clancy of Nancy Brown as the yes. voice of Savage Press in the Clone Wars. Brother, 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 is brother. that you, brother? You, brother, you, brother, you, That's brother. Right. <laughs> All right, Jester, All right but, hey, back to wait a minute, wait, hold on. Back to Frankie, Frankie in Manchester. So he's asking. Uh, he says, "I'm just curious if video games like this are classed as canon or not. I especially uh, it, it, since it was developed by Lucas Arts and the events of the game actually lead up to the events in Attack of the Clones." Thanks again. May the force be with you always, uh, Frankie. That I don't believe that this is canon. I think that this was wiped out. This is now part of legacy. So right, pretty right. much anything. In the expanded universe, outside of the novelization, the novelizations are still kind of in this kind of this uh, kind of weird purgatory where if the novelization contradicts anything in the film, the film takes precedence. Okay, if it's not contradictory to the film, then it stands as canon. That's where the novelizations live. But everything else prior to uh, uh, a new beginning, right? Was that the what was the name of that first novel in a the new current, dawn? A new dawn. That's right. A new dawn. Anything prior to that is uh, apocrypha, 
or Legends material. Right. And even when it was the expanded universe, in the prime of the expanded universe, there was a lot of conflicting stuff going on. Uh, you know, it wasn't exactly the tidiest ship. Um, no, no, the, the, no, no, let, no. Let's talk about Jaster Mareel. Uh, uh-huh. that, that actually developed into an individual via the Dark Horse comics. As uh, Jaster Mareel was an, a fellow Mandalorian. As was Boba Fett back then. Now, recall, Boba Fett has been deemed non-Mandalorian, in my opinion, because Senator Almec from uh, the Mandalore system said that he was, uh, they don't know how he got that that armor. He is a mere bounty hunter. And uh, so he was saying, essentially, not Mandalorian. I recently encountered a man who wore Mandalorian armor. Jango Fett. Jango Fett was a common bounty hunter. How he acquired that armor is beyond me. Okay, but back in the old days, uh, we did consider Boba Fett definitely to be a Mandalorian before we learned he was merely a clone of a bounty hunter. Um, and the Jaster Mareel thing comes from a book from 1995, Star Wars, The Essential Guide to Characters. Now, there were a few of these books that came out over the years, but this was the very first one published by Del Rey and written by Andy Mangles. And Andy Mangles was a guy who was writing about Star Wars. Uh, He was on the scene there in the mid-90s. He wrote, do you remember the Hasbro action figures? They had these little uh, character bios on the back that you were supposed to sort of like cut out. They, They were like little file cards you were supposed to cut out from the back of the uh, action figures and and store those away. Well, Andy wrote those, and I think he wrote for some other magazines like maybe Star Wars Insider or the top Star Wars Galaxy magazine. Uh, But Andy wrote this book, Star Wars The Essential Guide to Characters, 1995 edition, and Boba Fett, in the Boba Fett biography, it says... Long before Luke Skywalker journeyed to Tatooine to fulfill his destiny as a Jedi, Boba Fett was known as journeyman protector Jaster Mareel. Boba Fett was known Mm. as journeyman protector Jaster Mareel. Years passed, the ugly young law enforcement officer on the world of Concord Dawn had killed another protector. And though the dead man had been corrupt, disgracing his office in uniform, Muriel was still imprisoned for the murder. The arrogant young man remained unrepentant to the trial court, and Jester Muriel was exiled from Concord Dawn, stripped of all he owned. Muriel's adaptation of the name Boba Fett and the manner in which he acquired his rare battle armor are tales lost in time, remembered by no living being except for Fett himself. So this in this book, they're saying Jaster Muriel was from Concord Dawn, and he became Boba Fett. And Paul Bateman, of course, uh, it's been you know like borderline controversial that Paul merely even suggested this on an episode of Rebel Force Radio. <laughs> That's that, right. That the That's Boba right. Fett we see in the original trilogy is not the same clone of Jango Fett. He's someone entirely different, someone who had taken the armor from Boba or somehow acquired that armor and was going around saying he was Boba Fett. So, uh, you know, that met with a lot of uh, resistance from fans. Uh, they were calling for Paul to um, <laughs> to step down from <laughs> from being a fan. I mean, he got that serious. Uh, they said, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Step down from fandom. <laughs> or, uh, delete your fandom. Uh, yes. <laughs> delete your fandom. Please. That's, that's, that's going to be the next Rebel Force that's Radio t-shirt, much. by the way. It's going to be delete your fandom. Uh, <laughs> but no, I make all that up. I mean, Paul is beloved by Star Wars fans, and so I don't mean to besur- yes, merch his is. name or reputation in any way other than actually Love being Paul. associated with you and me. But <laughs> but so Jaster Mareel. So Jaster Mareel was not a separate individual. He was Boba Fett. However, the Dark Horse comics then did a Jango Fett miniseries. And in that miniseries, it explained that Jaster Muriel was not Boba Fett. He was just a fellow Mandalorian. 
and uh, Jango Fett was considered a Mandalorian. But this was all prior to the Clone Wars series with the introduction of the Mandalorians as a pacifist nation or planet and the Death Watch as members of, of their society who have splintered off in an effort to reclaim their warrior ways. <laughs> so, there, I just explained it. That's amazing. What a great, what a great history lesson. That's a history that you gave to us. Now, of course, none of that matters at all. No, none of it matters. All... <laughs> but you know yeah. what? Uh, guess what? None of it matters at all. Anyway, <laughs> whatever we talk about <laughs> on this show doesn't matter because Star Wars is not real. But right. uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, hold on! The phone lines are lighting up here right now at five nine one. You guys are blowing but... my mind right now. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, that so... was that was my dad's big criticism of Star Wars. By the way, we when we would watch it, he would say, "You know, this, this couldn't happen in real life, Billy." <laughs> Billy. <laughs> This... <laughs> yes, Dad. I, I love that he wanted to keep you grounded. Yeah, yeah. I, he, he really very know, important, he had, he very some, important life lessons being straight. taught in our house as kids. You know, <laughs> we love Star Wars. We love Star Wars. <laughs> it isn't real, you little jagoffs. Be quiet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you little jagoffs. Yes, yeah, I'll show you. I'll be loving this stuff more than ever when I'm almost fifty years old. <laughs> Stop with that force push, damn it. Just go wash my car. No, no force. Force push. Yeah. What is that? What are you force. trying to do there? Force push, Billy? Here, let me go go get us some McDonald's. Here's my keys. There's a ten spot in the keys to the yeah. keys to the Monte Carlo. Yeah, go force push yourself. Is that what Harrison Ford said? Yeah. Force yourself. Right? They asked him what he thought about the force. Did he believe in the force? I believe in force yourself. Right. I believe that was a Barbara Walters interview from the uh, early 90s. Early 90s. I have to dig that one up because mm -hmm. that is that is a classic when he's like, the force. Mm. <laughs> no. Yeah. Here's, here. Force yourself. That's what I say. Force. <laughs> may the force be with. No. Force yourself. God damn. God. <laughs> 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 and then all of a sudden he pulls out um, a miter box and just starts sawing away at something. And he's like, you know, hammer nails is out, you know. Come on, Barbara. <laughs> Bar Bunch of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> all right. We got uh, more feedback from uh, our Mandalorian coverage. This coming from Ishmael. Uh, is it Ishmael or is it Ismail? But regardless, it's uh, it's a great name. Here it is. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jimmy. My name's Ismail. I'm calling from Southern California. Wanted to continue last week's discussion on the Mandalorian. Um, I believe that based on the description we got from John Favreau, uh, we can actually tell what the show is going to be about in the aftermath series of books by uh, Chuck Wendig. Uh, there oh, is a character by the name of. Cobb Vanth. Um, this character is a self-appointed sheriff, essentially, of a place called Freetown on Tatooine. Not only does the location uh, match up, but uh, the timeline also does, since uh, the Aftermath series is uh, based on the, the fall of the remainder uh, or remaining Imperial forces and the build-up and formation of the First Order, so um, I think, um, based on that information, that uh, this guy would fit the gunslinger profile spot on. The few instances where he was mentioned in the books very much had that Western vibe we're getting from this, uh, this uh, photo and description. So wanted to get your guys' take. Um, love the show, guys. Um, really appreciate everything you guys do for us in the Star Wars community. And I also wanted to say Star Wars fatigue is not a thing. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yes, yes. Say it loud, say it proud. Ah, right. There you Ismail. go. Ismail, that's, that's great. He's awesome. Uh, and yeah, you, know, so you know what? Listen, as I just said, 
we're more into it now as as you know adults than we were as kids. So I don't think any fatigue is setting in whatsoever. <laughs> None whatsoever. Well, that, that, that's true. I have more toys now than I ever did as a kid. Oh, that's so great. Just, I mean, yeah. you know, the wish fulfillment that's going on here is, uh, is off the charts. Um, but, uh, but back to what he was saying, though. Uh, yeah, it, it is true. In those Aftermath books, there are these interludes that happen. And, I mean, these are probably some of the more interesting parts of those novels, uh, at least that first novel. Um, it was a guy purchasing... This damaged battle armor, this Mandalorian battle armor. And uh, it was pretty clear then, uh, as you kept reading along, that he was making the purchase on the planet Tatooine and that that armor was found outside of a Sarlacc pit. So uh, it doesn't take, uh, you know, uh, mm. you could be the most novice Star Wars fan. <laughs> you put two or two together, you go, oh, my God, this guy's purchasing Boba Fett's armor. Now, will this guy, uh, Cobb Vanth, um, number one, I, the name Cobb Vanth doesn't say, okay, that's a character who's going to be starring in the very first live action Star Wars series. Cobb Vanth. He sounds like, you know, uh, a, a, a third baseman for the uh, Philadelphia A's circa 1932 or something. I don't know. <laughs> Cobb Vanth. Now batting for the Philadelphia A's third baseman, <laughs> Cobb Vanth. Vanth. So it just doesn't it, it doesn't do it for me. Uh, the name Cobb, you know, Ty Cobb, whatever. Um, Randall, yeah. remember Randall Ty Cobb? Uh, he was Tex a, Cobb. Tex Cobb. Randall Tex Cobb. Ra- that's yeah. A, yeah, that that was his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was an actor slash kickboxer, if I remember correctly, <laughs> oh, from the eighties. Work man. Yeah. And uh, I, I think he appeared in maybe some Chuck Norris movies or something. If I, re- I, I can't uncommon remember. valor. Yeah, yeah. Is one. There you go. With Gene Hackman. He's in that. Yeah. Oh, that's that was a good movie too. But so, okay, um, enough with the Cobb talk. Uh, I don't think that this character is going to be the last Mandalorian. I don't see it being t- introduced to us in a novel. I mean, what, what, weren't the Aftermath novels supposed to be an introduction to The Force Awakens? I mean, wasn't that how it was supposed to roll out initially? And then, uh, so, I mean, to jump all the way ahead or all the way back to a TV series, depending on which timeline you're looking at. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to say that uh, John Favreau would be tapping into that. I think if there's anything Favreau's going to be tapping into is the George Lucas scripts for the original live action series. Remember, we used to hear that uh, uh, it was Rick uh, McCallum himself who mm, said it was mm-hmm. going to be like a Deadwood in space, you know? Yeah. And just yeah. everyone's getting the Western vibe by looking at that photo, that lone photo of the Mandalorian that was released. Now, okay, go back to the Aftermath novel that was set on the planet Tatooine. And as our... Uh, our uh, caller uh, Ismail uh, told us um, that uh, Cobb Vanth was sort of like a renegade sheriff of a, a border town. Somewhere. It's called Freetown. Freetown, yeah, Freetown, yeah. out yeah. there in uh, yeah. in the wastelands of Tatooine. I got to be honest with you. When I looked at that photo of the Mandalorian that was released last week, I got a Tatooine vibe off of that. It felt yeah. like he, you even said on the show last week he could be walking through Mos Espa, the marketplace of Mos Espa, as he you know, yeah. Star mm-hmm. Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Yeah. Um, I just kind of wanted to do a borderline comic book guy voice. It just every once in a while. I, though, I appreciate it. I you, like you know that. you get the urge. Yeah, We've been yeah. doing this for twelve years. Every once in a while, it feels good to do that. It's kind of cleansing. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> but um, Cobb Vanth. So I will give that a, you know like a, a forty sixty chance. You know forty percent of it. You know forty percent chance it would actually come true. I I, I don't think the odds are. In the favor necessarily, but I'm not ruling it out either because that little bit of information could have been placed into that novel based on those scripts for the live action show that George Lucas developed that are sitting on the shelf. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Like, oh, this is an interesting idea. Why don't we just throw it in there? Let's see what happens. Um, 
I think it's some great detective work, some great thinking uh, by Ismail, because uh, as you look at this here, you've got you got a very compelling character. You've got a slave uh, rising to become this uh, this sheriff of Freetown on Tatooine. He acquires the the chest piece of a Mandalorian from Jawas in uh, the year four ABY, which would, you know, that would put it around the same time as just post Return of the Jedi. He, uh, I guess he starts hanging out with Malakili, uh, you know, the, the Rancor Keeper at some point, and helps him raise a young hut named Borgo. Borgo. What is yeah. Malakili doing with a young hut named Borgo? That's, that doesn't uh, sound right to me. I mean, how, how did that happen? Hmm. What? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Later on, 2020, we'll talk about that. But <laughs> Freetown was attacked uh, by, and th- I'm, this is going off of uh, Wikipedia. So, uh, or well, st- yeah, Wikipedia. So, uh, thanks to those guys. Um, but Cobb he manages to enlist Tuscan Raiders help in driving the criminals of the Red Key Raiders away from Freetown. You throw all that together. I mean, that that sounds very much. I mean, that's that's all about. Uh, you know, kind of the the Wild West, the uh, the man with no name, the you know pale rider, the stranger comes to town, becomes sort of the the default sheriff as the corrupt sheriff runs away. Uh, that that sounds very much like something that George would have really mm-hmm. been, you know, the uh, the architect of. And yeah, um, I'm telling and, you, and, a fistful of dollars. Well, here here's a here's a question for you then. If it does go in that direction, uh, and this this is something that I think uh, will probably come up in our discussion of resistance. Uh, how well do you think um, a Star Wars series uh, will play out in if it's in one? setting i mean would will mm-hmm. are there enough excuses for for him to leave uh free town or mm-hmm. or, or that setting i mean yeah and, yeah, go, yeah, and yeah. go off world and stuff that and, is and interesting you bring that up and you do that's the one and, and you do say we pitch. may talk about this yeah yeah when we talk about resistance yes because this is something i was thinking about watching resistance today is uh how locked into this environment are we going to be? Well, if we're talking about an eight to 10 episode season one, and it's also, I think it could be a, a season that's one and done as far as the, the story of the Mandalorian goes. And then season two will be more along the lines of, uh, like I said, spin it off into something else. Um, but nowadays with streaming, I mean, you could run several different series at a time. You could have a Mandalorian season one and then launch something else like a Kenobi season one and then have. Mandal- I, yeah, You know what? They could just stack it on. Look what they do with Marvel. Well, I was going to say, I, I think if they it, what they might be looking to do is actually create a number of different series. Bob Iger is on record as saying that they've got multiple live action series in the works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could see them doing something where they've got them all kind of going off in their own directions, but they're taking place in the same timeline. And then you throw them all together for some crossover stuff. I mean, I, th- I mean, that kind of stuff does very, very well for uh, not just Marvel, but the DC universe uh, on television as well. Throw them together for a feature film. Throw them together for a feature film. You could do that as well. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, you know, movies, even Star Wars movies, uh, as we know with, uh, with Solo, uh, nothing's a lock anymore. Nothing as far as the, the, the profit and the revenue. So they've got to diversify. They've got to be totally multimedia. Uh, so whether it be films or television or, or traditional television or web, they're going to be everywhere, you know, and the books and the comics. So I, I actually think that there's going to be, um, you know, a, a, a real concerted effort here to be very uh, tight in terms of uh, the canon and linking all these these things together. Not to the point where uh, I think it, it it holds them back. I don't think they're going to be be that tight, but I definitely think they're going to want to uh, tie into one another. And I think, I think as much of a, a throwaway as we may decide, you know, resistance is, I think there's actually going to be, um, you know, a, a, a few contra or, uh, uh, continuity threads. They're going to be thrown in there. They're going to lead us into the force awakens. 
Yes, yes. I think whoever this spy is, you know, that they're leading up to is probably that is that is exactly what this the series is going to be all about. And I predict. Um, well, well, I'll get into that when we actually get into Star Wars Resistance to Classified, because I don't want to reveal too much about my thoughts about the plot until we actually get into that segment itself. I do have one more thing to say about The Mandalorian, and I need to go back to a lot of my analysis from last week, because I very self-righteously proclaimed, it doesn't matter to me where you get your Mandalorian history from, whether it be the video games or wherever, um, uh, comic books, video games, wherever. I get my Mandalorian information from the Clone Wars. Well, I was rightfully called out <laughs> for that by uh, Paul V. from Phoenix, who sent an email. Uh, subject line, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. <laughs> he says, he says, what are you doing? You can't just go with Clone Wars. You do have to recall there was a lot about the history of the Mandalorians being revealed in Star Wars Rebels. And I am totally ruling that out. And, and so Paul V. Uh, gives us this little refresher. He says, remember that Mandalorian space compromises thousands of worlds per Dave Filoni in a Rebels recon. So the last of the Mandos, as I was saying, I thought, you know, he was a lone gunslinger. He's probably the last of the, the breed of Mandalorians. They've been, uh, the, 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 their culture has been wiped out. Their warrior culture has been wiped out. I always thought Boba Fett was the last remnant of that warrior culture. But now I'm thinking that this Mandalorian, this title character in the upcoming series, is going to be on his own, the last of his breed. Um, but Paul V says, last of the Mandos? I highly doubt it! Moron! Mm. No, he didn't say moron. I threw that in. Because I'm feeling like a moron. Because he reminds us, as we learned in Rebels, the Mandalorians are subject to Imperial occupation during the original trilogy era, with Saxons Imperial loyalists fighting against the other clans under the leadership of Bo-Katan. So, there is all kind of Mandalorian stuff continuing post-Clone Wars. I always assume that the Jedi wiped out the Death Watch in the Clone Wars. And we just never got to see that because the Clone Wars series got canceled. So I'm hoping we see resolution of that conflict in the final season or the next season of Clone Wars, which is going to return next year. But so uh, Paul V continues and says, might the Mandalorian in this upcoming series... Might the Mandalorian be a disgraced former member of Clan Saxon? Whatever became of the Mandalorian Civil War and their own rebellion against the Empire? Hopefully we'll find out in one year's time. Well, Paul V., you're right. You have completely refreshed me on Rebels. I don't know why I ruled out all that very important historical information about where the Mandalorian culture, warrior culture, was specifically post-Clone Wars. And, uh, yeah, remember the Imperials? There were Imperial Mandos and all of this kind of crazy crap going on. So there, yeah. So that has to be resolved. That story, the Mandalorian Civil War, as presented in Star Wars Rebels, does need to be resolved. I believe. Uh, what, am I forgetting something? Satine returned, and uh, I guess just upon her mere return, that was uh, she brought Sabine, peace. not 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 Satine. Uh, Sabine, Satine. Sabine. Is, uh, see, see, yeah. see what they're doing to us here. <laughs> yeah, Sat I mean, Sat Satine uh, assumed room temperature back in the Clone Wars, but Sabine is is still around. All right. Uh, but she went off with. Remember though, she went off with Ahsoka to find Ezra. Mm-hmm. 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 So she, so she's right. Gandhi. I hope this Mandalorian, this live action thing, though. I I I gotta say, I don't want them to go heavy into the mythology. I want them to focus on establishing the character. If it's a central character that's carrying the whole thing, that's going to be the most important element. You know, I mean, so much so much of these backstories could be filled in uh, with with very economical writing, a sentence or two. You know, that just. <laughs> To, Bill, it, 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 it's you know what I mean. You say I'm not that. expecting yeah, yeah. all these answers and all these all these loose ends because the Mandalorian story is so 
it's so fluid at this point. I mean, there's been so much developed, and and uh, I, I just yeah, I'm not I'm not going into it expecting that they're gonna they're gonna tie all that up and address all that stuff. I hope they well, don't. Look, I, I look, hope they don't the feel responsible thing, though, right? to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that this is a this is a far more for me. It's a far more interesting concept if the guy is just a loner and the fact that he's a Mandalorian, uh, you know, gives him an excuse to essentially just wear a really cool costume. Yeah, well, that alone makes him intriguing to us. Well, sure, I mean, fans right. are already you know, I mean, that you already you already got him on your side with that. But I'm not so I'm not don't... chomping at the bit to find out what clan this guy hails from, <laughs> right? And how it ties into. Exactly. I mean, I'm just not. I mean, I, I'm not. Putting it down, that's just not my thing. I, I just want to see this guy. I mean, I love this idea of this kind of uh, uh, vigilante sheriff um, of Freetown that's, you know, walking around, masked man, uh, kicking ass, taking names there. I, I think that is a really cool idea. Now, you guys talk about, you know, Jim, I know you want to mention this uh, later when we get into uh, resistance to classified, but this idea of being in a stationary place, well, you know, let's say Freetown or wherever this this Mandalorian is, um, you know, it happens to be, you know, some sort of a, could be a, a, a trading port, could be some kind of a some sort of a hub where and that, and that was we, we kind of talked about Star Trek Deep Space Nine, how they kind of took the opposite of a starship going out on a on on, on missions and said, well, let's look at a a base um, where, you know, other ships are drawn to it. So they're bringing the instead of them chasing the action, the action is coming to them. So that very well may be what you you know we're looking at with the Mandalorian. The other concept that I threw out there is you know make it like the uh, the old Incredible Hulk series or the A Team, where you know he's just kind of a wanderer and shows up and he's sort of the reluctant hero. And you know there's a there's a town or a village in trouble and you know he's brought back into the action again. I mean that that kind of idea, but he's got his own quest that he's uh, that he's on. So I don't know that he's necessarily going to have to to stay put though. Uh, you, you think of a television series and budget and all of that, you know, how much can they do in terms of uh, shooting all over and, and having all kinds of uh, wild locations? I think it'll be kept close to home. So, yeah. All right. So uh, thank you very much, Paul V, for that. We've got uh, one more voicemail here from you or uh, for you. This is from the registered nerd. Now, the registered nerd. Uh, we uh, played a voicemail of his last week. Yeah. And uh, he was talking about Mando fatigue. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was talking. Was it Mando fatigue specifically or was it uh, was it Mando fatigue? It was Mando fatigue. And you said, hey, guys. he's not even going to watch the show. Yeah, Like you called him out and said he wasn't even going to give it a shot. Oh, yeah, because he was pretty he was pretty down on the whole thing. Like, yeah. I don't know, guys. I guess I'll watch it. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> But I like, I like the registered nerd because he's just like us. He's a nerd, but he actually has credentials. He's registered. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> he's card carrying. So, uh, so, yeah, I like him. I like certified. Him. Well, the, At the end of the show, I asked, I said, hey, call us back. Because I, I, I had a feeling he had more to say. Well, here he is. He's back. Hey, guys, it's the registered nerd. Hey, I just listened to the show. One, I love the show, of course. Still do. Always will. But I just want to clarify something. Um, Jason, I'm totally going to watch this show. Uh, you mentioned that I'm probably not going to watch it, but no, I'm 100% on board with the show. So I got off of work and I sounded a little tired, so it looked, sounded like I was kind of being more critical than what I was. No, I'm actually stoked about it. But, Jason says the same thing after it's, every it's show. A, it's a smaller butt, but, uh, you know, some people like smaller butts. I... <laughs> do have some reservations. I think that with this show, they could have gone in a different direction and maybe open up the storytelling just a little bit. I think they're being a little bit conservative. They kind of feeling that feedback already and they're being conservative. They want to get back to something that they know is a surefire hit. I don't blame them, but I was kind of hoping for something different. That's all. I'm going to love the show. I know it. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch Resistance. And that time machine thing would have been awesome. And my 17-year-old self would have peed his pants. Uh, and my 37-year-old self is kind of peeing his pants already. So, love the show. I love The Last Jedi. I love Solo. Um, yeah. Call me if you want to talk it out. You can. 
But I love you guys. Have a good day. Oh, we should yeah. call. It, we should call it right now. <laughs> yeah. That's the first right, time. Registered. That is the first time anyone uh, suggested we call them. Yeah, you guys I like number? that. Is I do it too have late? his number. <laughs> I don't know. It is. It, it's nine five one area code. Where, what's nine five one area code? Let me look this up. We should call nine five one area code. Uh, oh, it's California. Oh, so he's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He might be up. Well, you know, maybe, maybe sometime we'll we'll, we'll surprise him. But uh, we so got too says, much. We got too much to do. We, Bring we, it on we, to we register. Got a lot going on. Yeah, right. you know, we spent an hour <laughs> talking to him alone. I mean, it's, we we have a whole show here. We we got yeah. We got Billy show. Mac for God's sake for crying That's out loud. Um, right. But uh, okay, so yeah, this it was the Mando fatigue and and. Uh, I guess because he says, you know, he got off work and he's feeling tired. I understand that. I appreciate that. That, that happens to me. Happens to all of us. Um, but he said, you know, he's down. He's going to watch it. And uh, he's pretty sure he's going to dig it. But that, that was the point was just that it was like, oh, come on, Star Wars fans. Where have we gotten? You know, we get that amazing production photo. It's something that a lot of us have just been dying for our whole lives for 40 years. And this guy's like. Yeah, I don't know so much. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> he wants something new. He wants something yeah, fresh. And, yeah, and I'm yeah. telling, I'm telling everyone, I think that's going to happen. I really do. Yeah. I really do. It, it's just, I think it's really important that in this new era where Star Wars is back and it's current and it's infinite, I think that it's okay to ease into whatever is next. I feel like there's already been too much rushing to wipe the legacy underneath the carpet. And I just think a more tempered and even approach and um, a better paced approach will open up the doors naturally to all sort of new cool things. Yeah. And keep in mind, keep in mind too, it's, you know, just based on this one picture, just because it's a, uh, a costume, if you will, uh, that we recognize as being Mandalorian. Um, you know, we can't we can't conclude too much from that. I mean, Star Wars is a world that's filled with its own archetypes and and uh, uh, characters and, and creatures and stuff like that. And just because we've we've seen it before, in the sense that we can identify it. It doesn't tell us what they're going to be doing with that character. And it's how easy to jump to conclusions. Right, right. And it's not like, you know, I mean, think about when, when television shows come out, you know, and you get the preview for the new fall season or whatever like that. You know, if you see a, a picture of a police officer, you don't go, oh, my God, not another cop show. I mean, maybe some people do. But, I mean, if if the premise is cool and the acting's good and the right and the stories are good and yeah. you're taking a different approach to it, you don't. Dismiss it. Right, right, right. You think outright, about all the hospital I mean. dramas. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, oh, geez, another dramas. doctor show. I mean, I, I agree. There are a lot of doctor shows, and sometimes they are just run of the mill. Yeah. You know, it's uh, your garden but variety doctor show. But there's a reason show, why but, there are. There's a the, reason because they work, and those settings and those characters are, it, are, are interesting. It's a type, yeah. I mean, how, yeah. Many, how many great medical dramas have there been? There have been quite a few, you know, so you don't, you don't write them off automatically just because it's a familiar environment. That's just. That's just the door they're opening for you. That's all. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree. And I, I think that and, and, and I don't want to put words in the registered nerd's uh, mouth or you know, <laughs> thoughts in his head, but he might have been thinking along the lines of what we were talking about, Bill, just a few minutes ago. It's like, I don't know that I necessarily want this to be about the history of the Mandalorians and more civil war and more of this and more of that. Plans. I, the the clans, right, right, all of that. Uh, I, I just love the idea of this guy being sort of, uh, you know, vigilante going around and just kicking butt and stuff. I, I think that might be what uh, Register Nerd was was thinking about. But uh, thank you, Register Nerd. We appreciate it. Always great to hear from you. Please keep the, the voicemails coming. And one of these days we are going to uh, give you a buzz. Uh, but before we go any further, we do have a continuation of... A Rebel Force Radio investigative report. Thank you, Jason. I am Jimmy Mack from the Rebel Force Radio investigative report team. And uh, we have some new developments here in our investigation of the Wilhelm scream. That's right. You didn't send it. You didn't send it. Sorry, I would have played it, but you didn't send it. 
Only said it like 500 times in the past, but whatever. Okay, we'll have... Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on now. If you're going to be like that... I am. I don't know. Maybe you have a special one here. Fine. You know what? Just for that... There you go. That's oh, right. Have... The famous Wilhelm scream <laughs> is, of course, being uh, investigated very closely by us because everyone knows the Wilhelm scream was uh, a classic... Uh, uh, sound that Ben Burt lifted from an old film, Distant Drums, and uh, he uh, he pulled it. The character's name was Wilhelm, and he took an arrow into the leg. Feather River was another movie in which Ben identified that sc- same scream, and the char- ah! that's the one. Uh-huh. And uh, and uh, so it, it earned the name Wilhelm Scream because, of course, as I said, the character who initially emitted that sound uh, was a guy named Wilhelm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've been looking into the Wilhelm Scream because Matthew Wood has revealed that uh, – the original Wilhelm scream, which we've heard in countless number of movies, television shows, TV commercials, it has been retired by the folks at Skywalker Sound. But, but it's not enough to retire it. It's actually been replaced by something. And uh, we talked to Matthew uh, several years ago, and he, uh, he gave us a little info on uh, the Wilhelm scream and uh, its replacement. Well, there's another scream that's going to be on the horizon here that uh, we'll see. We're not ready to talk about yet. Okay, but it is like another old from a vintage film or yeah, something? Yeah, it's from something. But, yeah. Uh, it will be funny, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to... Oh, you're such a tease. I'm a tease, yeah. You're a tease. Yeah. Well, it's we'll in listening. Indiana Jones and the, and the uh, Crystal Skull. But, okay. Uh, but uh, and that's all you're going to say. Because yeah. you want to keep having fun with this yeah, one, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's like a new Wilhelm scream out uh, there. I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to be quoted <laughs> saying that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but it is. It's okay. That's what we're calling it. This is the new yeah. Wilhelm. So we're on the search for this. This is some uh, legit archaeology going on here. So it's, it's apropos that we're going to look very closely at an Indiana Jones movie to try and find this crazy Wilhelm scream. So uh, I actually do have uh, members of the investigative report team that I would like to identify right now. And I'm going to start with Scott Armstrong. He's a loyal RFR listener, and he's been going back and forth with me with all kind of information about his personal search for the Wilhelm scream. So he says, uh, check out Kingdom of the Crystal Skull around one hour and 26 minutes in when the Russian soldier is being consumed by ants. And so uh, he, th- he thinks this could be the new Wilhelm scream. Um, just hearing Matt Wood tell us that it's in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull somewhere, that just indicated to me I really need to go through that film with a fine-tooth comb and uh, find any scream in the movie that I consider to be a possible new Wilhelm scream. So I have a collection of Crystal Skull screams here for us all to review, and uh, let's hear what you think. The first one happens... uh, Relatively early in the movie, when Indiana Jones is fighting with those German agents who confront him at the warehouse, and uh, they're looking for something, and his buddy Mac has uh, stabbed him in the back. Mac has stabbed him in the back. Ah! Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Play that one again. again. Mm -hmm. Ah! Ah! Yeah, right. Like two, it's got two tones. Two tones. Two, two, two tones. notes, yeah. So, yeah. Jason, we'll be re- Jason, we'll be relying on you to give us your interpretation of the scream after we hear it. Okay. So it'll, it'll be clear to everyone because sometimes it gets a little buried in the mix, as we uh-huh. hear in scream number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so two tone. We'll call that mm-hmm. one. Scream number one is two tone. Okay, scream number two, um, I I believe this happens in the same sequence of the movie uh, when uh, they're driving a a jeep through this warehouse and uh, mayhem is is, uh, ensuing around them. Ooh, 
ooh, that's kind of the shaky scream. <laughs> ooh, it's like the Jacob Marley scream. What's going on? How do you get off of this thing? <laughs> I don't know how it works. Here, let's hear this one again. I'm a ghost. <laughs> Jacob Marley. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Crystal Skull Scream number three is is the one mm-hmm. I believe that our uh, team member Scott Armstrong was identifying. It happens at one hour, 26 minutes in when the Russian soldier is being consumed by ants. Mm. Mm. Ooh, I got to hear it's that one again. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a grunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a grunt with something a little extra. Yeah, <laughs> kind of a two syllable. Yeah, it's a but. grunt with a side of scream. Grunt with something yeah. extra, uh, but that's not that's the first soldier. There is a second soldier that Ooh. we see, and he's like the main goon, you know. And uh, he fights with Indy, and then uh, Indy punches him out, and then he gets consumed by the ants. Okay, this guy. <laughs> I don't even want to. I don't even name this one. This this is this is like <laughs> this is like when a mouse runs across your kitchen floor and you jump up on the chair. <laughs> I like that one. Uh-huh. I like that. One. I was thinking more like fingers chopped off. Like you. <laughs> now my favorite is Look number. Down. My favorite is number one. Uh, Two tone. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. I like that one a lot. Uh huh. I like that one. Uh-huh. But I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I, I have. I, I cannot confirm. But I did hear from another one of uh, our members of the uh, RFR investigative report team. Mm. I heard from Joey Lombardo. Joe Lombardo says, uh, back in May, after leaving the theater from a solo show, I tweeted you guys and Matt Wood because I thought I ear spotted Wilhelm 2.0. Ooh, I like how Joe calls it Wilhelm 2.0. Hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, he said, Matt, hit me back, Matt Wood, that is, hit me back quickly with a like. And uh, Joey says he's uh, taking that as 100% official confirmation. Now, Mm. I don't know. I don't know if we can simply say a like from Matthew Wood indicates confirmation. But I do have the scream isolated from that exact moment as Han is driving. Oh, here's the tweet, by the way. I should read that. Uh, This is uh, Joe Lombardo at Cookie Jones Jr. Great uh, Great Twitter name there, uh, Cookie Jones. Um, mm. And he tweets, uh, saw Solo third time, and I think I ear spotted the new Wilhelm. Is it when Han flies the M68 speeder into the tie factory and the first worker jumps out of the way? All right, so when Han, uh, he steals the speeder, he flies it into that tie fighter factory there on Corellia, and as he's whipping that speeder in there, a guy dives out of the way, and he makes this sound. And this is what Joe Lombardo thinks is Wilhelm Scream 2.0. Let me hear this one again. Mm. Definitely not two-tone. Hey, you know what? Didn't we have a, a scream uh, last time from, oh, from Rogue One? Yeah. All right. Here, That's I got her. that one. Uh, mm. That almost sounds mm. like the the original, like cut in half or something. Yeah, let's, let's, let's listen to this one again. It's very, very quick, but I don't think it's the same as... <laughs> Ooh, it's it's kind of close. Wait a minute, it's close. But it, it, wait, no, wait, it's not wait, the wait, same. Wait, no. does, do the, hold on. Let's. Do you want me to play it again, Bill? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So here's uh, Rogue One, and 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 here's Solo. It's close, but it's not the same. No, it's, it's a little. It's a little different. 
That that yeah. solo one seems to have a little extra, little. Pump. <laughs> Yeah. Little, little, yeah. Where, where, where's this one? Little from extra one. Ah! Ah! Shorter, shorter. Whatever. It yeah. sounds like the same person. It does. I will say that it sounds like the same person. I've, I, as I've been reviewing a lot of these screams, I've come to the conclusion that it is the same person doing it a lot of times. Sometimes I can tell when it's actually Matt Wood himself, but. Mm. Um, other times, I, 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 I just hear similarity in a lot of the screams. So uh, this isn't going to go away. This is not yeah, going to end. A, I'm, I'm not going to walk of, this. A lot of screamers in my day. <laughs> all right, screamers. all right. We're not going to bring your personal, uh, what, what you do on weekends, into the show. <laughs> but uh, I am going to uh, have an answer by next week. Um, you think so? Yes. You're going to have a definitive answer by next week? Maybe even by the time the sun comes up tomorrow morning because oh, I am, I, I, you're I, on to something. I feel I feel like I'm on the verge of something big here. So, ooh, now ooh. did you did you get the impression that Wood Wood made it sound like that this was a sound effect that it was lifted from something that would be yes. interesting to people if they knew it? Yes, yeah, yeah, I did, I did. He seemed to be coy about the origin of it. And I said, yeah. does it come from a classic film, something like that? And he said, well, it's, you know, something like that is what he said. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. that's what I'm I'm getting. Although you, it, if he reveals it, he's got to give it a new name. You can't do new Wilhelm. I like that, Wilhelm 2.0. Uh, I just... I, there has know, to be something to make it significant, to indicate that this is... Taking yeah. on the mantle of it, it because it essentially is. It, it's Wilhelm is more of like a bestowment, it's like a title, it's like mm. you know, it, it's more than just a character, it's it's more than even a screen, quite honestly. <laughs> it, it's a way, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of life. It's a, yes, it's, it's a way of life. <laughs> I just I, well, I guess it depends on on what he what what he says is where he says it's from. Because I just I always think of the remember Roger Ebert had those um, what did he he put out a book of them? But they were like Ebert's simple rules or something like that. And one yes. of them was was never um, what was it? Anything that has the word new in it. Is is of lesser quality. <laughs> it was basically so, like <laughs> new odd couple. I think you know is maybe the example he gave. Yeah. So I never yeah. trust anything that has new in the front of the title. Right. It'll it'll only make you want the original. <laughs> new Coke. It's so true. Oh, oh man. Well, that's amazing. So Jimmy Mack said it here on Rebel Force Radio that next week he's on the verge of something and should have. A definitive answer as to what is the new Wilhelm. Rancho Obi-Wan is home to the world's largest Star Wars memorabilia collection, as recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records. Become a member of Rancho Obi-Wan right now to get exclusive access to tours of Rancho Obi-Wan hosted by Steve Sansweet, invites to special events, and more. Plus, you can also make a difference and help Rancho Obi-Wan grow with a simple donation of $1 or higher. Visit RanchoObiWan.org now to get the latest news, become a member, or make a donation. RanchoObiWan.org. This is Star Wars Resistance. Declassified. All right. Star Wars Resistance, the latest animated effort from Lucasfilm Animation, and as I called it at the top of the show, the Filoni-verse, debuted this past week on the Disney Channel. But for those of you that are subscribers to the various streaming services like Hulu or the, uh, the Disney app, which they consolidated, by the way. They used to have a Disney XD app. They used to have a, a Disney Junior app. They used to have just a Disney Channel app. It's all consolidated under this Disney app, which uh, gives you access to a lot of those shows. And if you are a Hulu subscriber, which uh, we are in my household, it also unlocks 
the Disney app for you because uh, Disney, with its acquisition of, uh, of Fox, has now the uh, the majority owner of Hulu. So there's some real tight integration there. Already? Uh, they're yeah, already? Oh, yeah. I mean, they just bought the thing. There's already tight integration. Well, I mean, the fact that if you are a Hulu subscriber, it also uh, those credentials will also unlock the uh, the Disney uh, app. Yeah, I would call that fairly tight. Uh, I didn't know that. The, yeah. This is uh, something I got to jump on. There you go. Uh, so the uh, the episodes are air, uh, aired or were were posted, whatever you're going to say in in, in today's uh, day and age. And I watched. I didn't watch all three. Um, I watched the the, the pilot. Which was, was that re- new recruit or recruit? Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't watch the uh, the, the other two. I, I started watching the second episode, so I know that uh, it sort of starts off with sort of the, the adventure of the week or the mission of the week sort of concept. Um, but I got to tell you, right off the bat, I know that uh, there's been some comments about the animation saying, oh, this looks cheap. This looks cheap. Um it doesn't look like the Clone Wars. It doesn't look like Rebels. Um, but, guys, I think that it's, uh, and I said this uh, way back at the beginning when we start, got our first glimpse, I think this is a blessing because I think they're going to be much more fluid in their ability to tell these stories. I think that clearly we're seeing a much more densely populated universe than we ever saw, particularly in the beginning of uh, of Clone Wars and even into Rebels. Um, it just gives them more flexibility. It allows them, I think, to produce these uh, shows faster. Uh, we already saw Poe Dameron had a costume change, <laughs> which is like mm-hmm. something we could never dream. We oh, no, d- in the right, early didn't... days of the Clone Wars, like oh my god, Obi Wan and... Kenobi was going to bed in his Clone War <laughs> uh, armor. Say it, kids in bed, and he's wearing armor. <laughs> it's like all right, all right, guys. Well, you know, I mean, I thought at least give him a blanket and cover that up or something. Right. You know. but, but oddly enough, Count Dooku had pajamas. <laughs> he sure did. I think with like um, with the nightcap uh, and, and very smart <laughs> slippers. It, it was quite the ensemble. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it's silky, too. Very comfortable looking. But it was it was cool to see Poe Darren in his flight suit and then later in, you know, the, the leather jacket. Yeah. Um, it was it was it was great. So I, I think uh, if we're just looking at the animation, um, I, my thought is that, uh, you know, it's kind of nice to not have them beholden to uh, this this super high standard, which which slows them down. Well, and I think the biggest difference, though, I mean, when you talk about the animation, the one thing you cannot deny, because, I mean, it's easy to compare it to the Clone Wars and Rebels. But there is an element that is still present that was present in both those other two series. And he's really a secret weapon at Lucas Animation, a guy by the name of Joel Aaron. And Joel is the guy who is the mastermind behind all that lighting and, and the, the brilliant way that uh, the shadows play and the, the rich, dense texture he gives to every scene that he, uh, he puts his fingerprints on. And, and Joel has the uh, title of uh, Director of Cinema Photography Lighting. For this show, a very specific, wow. you know, very specific yeah. um, in terms of animation. But Joel is something of a master at that. And uh, we've seen his work in the previous two series. And I'm seeing it in this one. For as simplistic as some of the animation may look, there are certain moments where it's really just like jaw dropping. Uh, some of the, the, especially in the first episode, uh, in The Recruit, the dog fighting going on at the very beginning of the episode I thought was spectacular. Yeah, I was surprised at how because my initial uh, reaction, I think, to the trailer was that I, 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 I thought it looked kind of flat. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think a lot of people and felt that way. Very two dimensional stuff. Which I don't, you know, it, I don't know. At the end of the day, to me, it's a cartoon. I mean, I grew up watching Tennessee Tuxedo. I mean, there was no; <laughs> those were those were entirely flat. You know, I just figured, well, okay, this looks different. Um, but, uh, you know, once I started getting into the episode, um, about halfway through there walking around and there was a lot of shadow and light and stuff going on. So I'm not sure what constitutes cheap looking. I didn't, I didn't, that wasn't my impression, uh, after viewing that full episode. Well, I mean, when you compare it to the, yes, I understand of the clone wars. 
and even rebels for that matter. Uh, this this one definitely does look a little more economical. Let's just say. Well, l- let us not forget. I mean, there was when we saw, and, and I, I think I might have been with both of you guys when we saw our first glimpse uh, of uh, the Star Wars: The Clone Wars, Wars and yeah. and saw Dave Filoni for the first time there at Star Wars Celebration. Uh, people were talking about Thunderbirds and wooden marionettes and and all of that. So there mm-hmm. was some criticism about the the animation style. Uh, at that point, then yeah, by the what, time Rebels came around, you know we, we had seen it with Clone Wars. We thought, okay, well, this is not quite Clone Wars, but it's you know it's certainly uh, a quality animation. But it evolved and it changed. But Bill, right from the outset, there were a lot of people that didn't like the Clone Wars. Yeah, totally. Well, then the Clone Wars evolved so much. I mean, some of these things you just got to kind of let it breathe a little bit. Um, but yeah, that was my impression. I was I remember thinking, yeah, wooden puppets. Was mm-hmm. what the Clone Wars looked like to me when it first, you know, it took a little get, a little bit of getting used to. I'll that's admit. what it looked like. Yeah, yeah. Didn't we do like a parody song about Obi Wan's wooden nuts or something like that <laughs> <laughs> for Christmas? I can't believe I said Obi Wan had wooden nuts. <laughs> I we did say that he that he he looked an awful lot like a, a nutcracker. That's that that's for sure. And he did. He had a very nutcracker look. I, and and now they did soften it and they started moving the hair in tribute to Jimmy Mack uh in in subsequent seasons of the Clone Wars. But one guy that never changed and never never softened at all was the look of Dooku. He was one of the most extreme looking of the characters uh in the Clone Wars. But it it, it really worked for him. Yeah. Uh with the with this with this the look is um uh, much more, uh, gosh, I hate to say realistic, but they, they are a little bit more realistic. I think they're actually, um, in in a lot of ways, I think they're more expressive um, with this series. And and you, when you pointed out Joel Aaron, I I didn't know that, but now when I look back, I'm like, well, no, that's not surprising because, despite the fact that it has a very familiar style of animation, I thought that one of the things that was surprising about it was how deep that it looks i love the use of shadows i'm thinking about you know the episode where they go into the uh into the the junk shop with the two junk dealers uh and they're kind of you know in the shadows there pulling all those parts out for the ship i thought that that was a really uh, rich scene given the limited lighting that we were supposed to to have and there's a scene where they're walking around in the hangar i think talking and there's it's like uh, I believe it's sunset or something. And there, mm, you know what I'm talking yes, about? Right. There's, yep. And there's a lot of sunlight playing off of their faces and stuff like that. And it, it had a lot of depth to it. I thought. Yeah. That was the one that made me kind of notice it. I wasn't really thinking about it until that that part. Uh, Joel Joel certainly knows what he's doing. He's a master at his craft, and he's been at Lucasfilm for over 20 years. He and he's a really great guy on top of it too. Who actually. Uh, Jason, you and I were actually uh, subjects of uh, his photography at one point. I think yeah, he said we broke his camera just by you know, <laughs> yeah, by, yeah. by appearing in the viewfinder. It was never usable again. <laughs> it, was, it was very. Just remember him being very gentle. That's all. <laughs> yes, right. And and I, I also remember that the uh, that uh, fur rug he had us laying on was not as itchy as I thought it would be. It was, <laughs> You look kind of weird. There's a lot of stuff I like about this series, though, you know, beyond the technical stuff and beyond the way Joel lights uh, Yeager's dreadlocks. I mean, there's uh, – which was, by the way, spectacular. Um, but uh, just a lot of little things I was picking out as I went along. So I actually, guys, I actually took some notes. And uh, if I can, just run down some of the things that really sort of stood out to me. Uh, uh, for starters, you know, right out of the gates – we're seeing that Kaz is flying an X-wing for the res- for the uh, for the Republic, for the yeah. New Republic. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that was interesting that um, because I always thought that X-wings were a tool of the ragtag group of rebels that uh, you know patched together their ships to fight the Empire, and mm-hmm. then I, I felt like the same was true for the Resistance in the future. But it looks like the uh, the, the legitimate military of the government 
uh, uh, took to flying X wings. So uh, mm-hmm. you know that that's something interesting to add to the canon because we know so little about what was going on with the New Republic that's right. in that twenty thirty year period between. The OT and the oh, they get they get blown away, you know, an hour or so into the into the movie. So you're right, we never yeah, we see know them nothing. at their at their peak. So Kaz is flying his X wing with his droid C four. It made me think of Star Wars Celebration four in Los Angeles, the first place I actually met Jason Swank face to face. Oh. Sing- I started thinking about dynamite, isn't that yeah. C4? <laughs> yeah. It, when we were flying out to L.A., we, we were saying to ourselves in the security line, don't say anything about C4. Because <laughs> we were all referring to a celebration for C4. Oh, that's, the, oh, that's right. The memories. The memory. Yeah. Single tear. Uh, <laughs> but uh, C4 was the joy. So I was like, oh, my God, he looks like that action figure. I remember the blue R2 unit from the Phantom Menace, R2B1. And that was actually an action figure uh, that you could purchase in the year 2000. It was slightly different, though. Slightly different. Um, we get info about Kaz. We learn a little bit about his background. His father is a rich senator who considers the resistance to be extremists. Mm. So that right there gives you an indication of what the general opinion was about this militia group. Uh, they were considered to be extremists, you know. I mean, they, they were the the resistance was thinking about the greater good of the galaxy and the new republic and everything just as much as any senator would. But they were willing to take action to smoke out the first order, who at this point in time, I believe, is mostly working in the shadows. They make mention of a a base uh, that they you know they don't know about because it's in the uh, the part of uh, unexplored space, what are the unknown yeah. regions or whatever they Yeah. Call. The other thing, Jim, I would mention is that there's a moment where uh, Yeager is sort of uh, almost accusing Poe of, of, of seeing Imperial ghosts everywhere. He says, look, the Empire's gone. What, yeah. are you, what, 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 are you, what are you doing here? I mean, the, the, those days are over. Why are you seeing uh, this, uh, this, this new threat? Um, so you you get a sense that yeah they think they're extremists maybe you think they're a little paranoid yeah so that's kind of like the general attitude probably in the galaxy uh, considering the relationship with the New Republic and the resistance the resistance from what we can assume was something that was spearheaded by Leia because she was frustrated with the fact that people weren't heeding her warnings about the First Order in the government, in the Senate. So she split and left organized government to build a militia group that would be in place to stand up to the First Order when they finally did strike, which we see happen in The Force Awakens. You know, what's funny is if you think about it, and I don't know if this has been, been brought up, but I know that a number of people have said, well, you know, what are the odds of the, of this happening where you have this uh, imperial uh, totalitarian force uh, sort of taking over the galaxy and then 30 years later uh, someone else tries it again or the remnants try it again? Um, and I, I, Bill, I know you're a bit of a, of a history buff. Isn't this pretty much what Don't happened me. with World War One and World War II? Don't stun me. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah I but mean, I mean, certainly Germany. Uh, yeah, but I mean, they, they, um, oh my gosh, I don't even want to go into all the particulars because I'm, I'm going to get something wrong and I know it. But, but of course, but, but, the, well, the but, Germans yeah, no, were, is, you know, no one of the listening. criticisms after World War One is that the Germans were, uh, too severely punished, you know, and that, that the, the, the lack of power they had gave rise to the Third Reich. So, um, you know. There's the, there's that whole parallel that you can right. you can right and if you draw. think about Princess Leia as a as a Winston Churchill type character who's standing there and and you know screaming that uh, you know the sky is falling and nobody was was really listening oh you're you know extremist you're trying to harken back to your your glory days uh, in the war 
and and that sort of thing. So, I mean, for those of you that think like this, this can't happen in the real world, um, you know, there, there may be a, a a bit of history there that kind of in our own world that sort of explains. Yeah. That. Well, and there's also a, a sense that I and I don't know if this uh, comes up in the in in this show, but I think I think it it certainly does in the movies where. It's like the the first order is known, but they're not taken as a serious threat, right? You right. know, which I, you know I think is uh, you could certainly draw some comparisons to that uh, uh, regimes that have existed in the modern world and and how people in the press and intellectual circles defended you know communist re- regimes and what have you. I mean, so it's like they were there, but you know it was. Mm-hmm. They they weren't anti the regime. They were anti people who were anti the regime. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you follow that? Exactly. <laughs> I did. I did. So meanwhile, Poe Dameron yes. reveals in this first episode, The Recruit, that he does reveal that the resistance has received intel that confirms the First Order is planning a full-scale attack. Okay? Oh. And uh, also they received a tip about a First Order informant slash agent working from Colossus, which is a uh, super tanker fuel depot that's located on the planet Castellan, according to, uh, I, I want to call him Ezra every time. Like, uh, Kaz. Yeah. Okay, the line Kaz, is, the Kaz. line is very thin between Ezra and Kaz. They seem. I called have... him. I actually called him Kazra. Kazra. Uh, I was telling my kids at dinner tonight about the show. I'm like, oh, you really like this character, Kazra. Kazra. <laughs> so Kazra, yeah, because I mean, it's just the same amount of over enthusiastic bullheadedness almost he's not really bullheaded i shouldn't say that about he hasn't revealed that so much uh ezra definitely was bullheaded from time to time but uh but uh kaz just seems just very enthusiastic extremely enthusiastic and he also he has a chip on his shoulder he has something to prove because mm-hmm. apparently his father greased the skids for him to get into the yeah you know, into the academy and into the republic navy and all this so he wants to you know say i can do this on my own i i have the skills i can handle it so uh, Poe reveals all this stuff, takes Kaz out to that that platform, and, and they reveal that on that platform there's gambling going on there. So I thought mm-hmm. to myself, ooh, ooh, could we see older Lando make an appearance? Gambling, anyone? So I, 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 what do you think, Puppet Lando? What are the odds of you making an appearance there on the Colossus? Well, I think I would bet an entire idiot's array that it it uh, <laughs> that it would make the show much smoother. <laughs> yes, it would make the show very smooth. Thank you, Pup Hitlando. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, Jim, that was what I was thinking was that you know they they placed this series in a very interesting uh, location where people are going to be flying in and out. And they've got a, a built-in reason to have uh, characters, you know, sp- spanning the saga potentially, uh, certainly with a lot of different uh, alien races and species uh, dropping in from week to week. And I, th- that part of it, I think, is very exciting. You know, could we see a Han Solo dropping by and refueling uh, uh, that that big beast of a ship that he was flying before he reacquired the Falcon? That's that's a possibility. I also, you know, thought of Lando. I also thought of a you know Maz Kanata dropping in. Um, there, there could be uh, the possibilities are endless for these little cameo appearances. I think uh, Maz Kanata is is definitely going to show up on this show. I, I don't you know I don't know if she's going to be voiced by uh, Lapita Nuango or who, but uh, I, I think the odds of her showing up are great. I mean, absolutely great because it seems like she rolls from one thing into another. You know. Uh, her her castle gets trashed, and then the next time you see her, she's got jetpack on, and she's fighting with. Her. <laughs> yeah, was, there's no downtime for that 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 uh, crazy Maz. So, um, I'd like to see her show up. Uh, something that I like about the just general 
vibe and appearance of the show is the fact that it shows respect to the legacy of Star Wars alien species. Yes! Right. Unlike yes. unlike the sequel films have. Unlike the films like Solo and Rogue One even. It's not just regulated to the, the sequels. It's also those standalone films. But here in this show we got... Um, I tried to mark down the... Uh, the different species. Uh, we do see a Bith, you know, the, yep. from the mm-hmm. famous Cantina Bith. Of course, he's sitting there fumbling around with some kind of musical instrument, you know. It's like these guys can't be away from their uh, their <laughs> instruments at all. <laughs> right. The whole, I mean, imagine Jams. living on whatever their native planet is. It's, it's probably a racket all the time. People jamming all the time. It's like every, <laughs> sure, all musicians. every crappy garage band ever lives on your block. You know, I mean, oh, God, and they're playing at all hours. So you got the Bith, you got a a, a, a Godel, a Godel. Yeah, yeah, Godel. Yeah, yeah. Godel, Godel, whatever. Mm-hmm. But he, I say Godel because he gave out a, you know. He, <laughs> he did do one of those. Yeah. He did, you know. Sure. I Look. see the one with the two horns on the head. Or is yeah, he got two yeah, horns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a Rodian. A Rodian mm-hmm. showed up. I, mm-hmm. you know, he's a he's a little um, uh, overweight Rodian. You know, mm. which, which yeah. is well, kind yeah, of a different you know, look. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. That's yeah. fine. It happens. It happens. Um, we all get the middle aged spread. Oh, Ant Anti Z is the yeah. same uh, species as Uncar Plut. Yeah. Which so now I, I like what I'm seeing here. Now, okay, we have some original trilogy mixing in with some sequel trilogy. Yes. And to make it just right, you have thrown in there uh, one of those little pod racers. Uh, I, I think it's called an Alima. An Alima. Am I right about that? I, I, I believe so, and that's voiced he, by D. Bradley Baker. Oh, was he? He was yeah, the one that definitely. burned up, right? It was the one they showed in the in Phantom Menace burning up. Yeah, what what was that guy's? I, uh, I, yeah, he's I, the one that says poodoo, right? Uh, no, I think he. No, no, Bill's that, right. Bill's he right. He slammed he's kind of into the wall. Oh, he. D- he's, oh, there's a shot of him like going into flames, right? Yeah. He's just like, he, ah! Right, and then he goes right into the wall. His arm, little arms are waving. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. What right. are we laughing at? <laughs> All right. the, the, the character. How, how about of... how about this? That uh, that uh, Uncar Pluck, uh, the Mrs. Uh, what's her name, Mrs. Z. I love yeah, it yeah. when I love when they have monsters that are wearing makeup. I, that always I always get a kick out of that. <laughs> oh, she's wearing a little rouge. As if that she's makes she... her much more attractive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, whatever helps. <laughs> you know, well, different. Yeah, you know, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? But um, it's an Aline, an Aline, and the character that you're thinking of from the pod race is Rats Ty- Tyrell. Rats Tyrell. Yes, 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 Rats. Rats, and he is an Alina. And uh, so uh, introduced in Star Wars Episode One, and then mix him in. There's a Barada. There's a, the, the dancer. Um, her name was R- Ristal, Ristal. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, she Stahl? was from right. the special edition. And she is half human, half Thelin. Okay? Thelin. 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 Mm-hmm. It's a T H E E L I N. Oh, oh, Thelin. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. You know. Okay, not... Wait, who's the Barada? Come on, Jason. Know your Thelins from your Thelines. Who's the Barada? <laughs> the Barada is that big dude who was chucking people off of the platform. Is he the guy that has the uh, fish on his T-shirt? Uh, yes, the- and he also has a tattoo of the Black Sun. Oh, okay. I, I thought he was a, a Potsnicken. Or what's that one? <laughs> Pl- <laughs> Potsnicken. You know who I'm talking about? What's his name? Potsnicken. <laughs> yeah. No, I think he's a a, 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 a Clatoonian. A Clatoonian. A Clatoonian. Uh-huh. uh-huh. A Clatoonian. These are words I don't use in my day-to-day I understand. Lifestyles. Uh, but I save it for the Star Wars stuff, and it, it really serves me well. Clatoonian. Well, I thought that guy was the same thing as Grumgar from Maz's cast. He's not. He's not. He's I, not a Grumgar. No, he's okay. not a Grumgar. Uh, a Grumgar is something entirely different. Uh, a a Grumgar okay. is a Dautin. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. They, they are a hulking species, the Dautin. Well, well, this guy was pretty hulking, but... Uh, 
But it makes sense that he's a Barada. I See, suppose, he, you, yeah. he would be a Dawutin if he had horns protruding from his chin. But he does not. He just has the jowls of a Clatoonian. I, so I, I would love to s- teach a college course on Star Wars alien species, you know? And just all day long, we stand around in a lecture hall and saying things like, Clatoonian, Darwinian, <laughs> Barada. Don't kid yourself that that is not happening on a oh, college Oh, give me a grant. Somewhere. I want a grant <laughs> for Christmas. Also, I noted uh, there's two snaggle tooth. Would that, yeah. make, would oh, yeah. that make them snaggle teeth? Snaggle teeth. teeth. <laughs> snaggle teeth. And of course, he's he's a Snivian, a Snivian. Uh-huh. Uh, let's let's all say it together, class. Snivian, Snivian. Yes, and I, I think Mr. Mac. I think that's what he is. Um, uh-huh. I, I could be wrong, but that doesn't matter. It's my class, and there are, there are two of those snaggle tooths. Uh-huh. Um, and one of them I noted has um, he has a mohawk. Uh, so I thought that hmm. was pretty impressive. Very impressive. I, I loved. Loved how this series uh, incorporated characters and and looks uh, from the whole saga so far. I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I thought it was. I thought that was brilliant. Mixing I love up. how populated uh, this show is with with characters and creatures. Um, I, and you know, frankly, if if it means perhaps a lesser quality animation, but to get a a, a richer uh, place for these stories to to happen, I'm all for it. I'm yeah. all for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think all of these like background characters, they all kind of come into play also. And and that's something I always have loved about the Simpsons. You know, all the background players. Oh they, yeah. They all come into play. And you start seeing it because I did watch the next two episodes, uh The Triple Dark, uh which is a great episode that introduces pirates. And it shows pirates raiding the platform, which was really cool. And then the third episode, Fuel for the Fire. Fuel for the Fire introduces uh-huh. Elijah Wood's character. And that character is a – he it turns into a rival for Kaz. Uh, mm. they, they, they become rivals. And and then, you know, it's, so it becomes a little more um, – for a Star Wars series, it's, it's very down to earth. You know, like, you know – it's about this guy and his relationships and the people he's meeting on this platform it really doesn't have to do with the big overall galactic conflict. However, you are constantly reminded that Kaz is spying and he tries to listen into some, you know, he, his idea of spying is basically eavesdropping. I, I guess that's how we all do it, right? I don't know. Uh, Bill, Bill, for, for, for a while, Bill, I, I don't think people know this, but Bill, uh, didn't you work uh, professionally as a private detective? For some- uh, not a private. Well, I was. I investigated uh, insurance fraud. Uh, but I, I hated that job. Didn't they put? Wait, 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 wait hold on. Oh, years ago, this was like stop 20 the years tape, ago. rewind, yeah. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you went undercover as part of some sting operation against an insurance company? Who was your employer? No, 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 no. We we um it was it was mostly uh over the phone and stuff and inter- you know, you just would interview people and try it was like 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 people taking out uh car loans and uh, you know with the, the, did you do funny voices so they didn't know it was you it was like i'd like to take out a loan on I his think car so, i think sometimes yeah i think sometimes <laughs> i did oh. and everybody everybody treat you know billy d of course right everybody, everybody just lied to you and treated you like garbage it just it was awful oh my gosh <laughs> like secret shopping but looking for uh Corruption and yeah, wow. trying to find people, skip tracing. Ugh. So, if you were calling someone to interview them and you had to disguise your voice as Billy D, as Puppet Lando, what would you say? Just like I pick up the phone, hello. Uh, hi. What? <laughs> come on, Billy. Come on, Puppet Lando. It'll come back to you. Come on, come, come on. on. What, what would you? Say? What, what were those calls like? It's like insurance well, I'm, fraud. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I caught you at home. My name is Inspector Calrissian. <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. What? <laughs> I have a you know, we've been looking for your son for a long time. He's uh, <laughs> um, 
I can't even remember how I used to do that stuff. Oh, <laughs> uh, it sounds like a terrible job. I, I used to work in... Uh... You know, I'm sensing a little bit of deception here. <laughs> Why, you slimy, double-crossing swindler. Harold, did you call Mr. Calrissian back? (laughs) I'm going to keep leaving messages now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to be... You know, I'm going to be on you like a Ugnod on a... All right. I now I don't know. I can't. Think. What what do Ugnats go after? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> no, I Carbonite saw, blocks. I saw him running around with that ice cream maker. I know. <laughs> I know he's up to some deception. All right. So we've got. <laughs> Are you calling out Wilro Hood? <laughs> yeah. was, was that who you were calling? Was Wilro Hood? Yeah, I guess so. Apparently, that ice cream maker was uh, not proper. Well, I always wondered where he was running from. <laughs> He's taking some of my stuff. <laughs> I love where this is going. Uh, all right. Okay. Now, Jim, you caught a number of uh, uh, of great little Easter eggs there in the, in the, in, the, in terms of the uh, various alien creatures. Uh, I have a list here. There was a hammerhead, too. Don't forget oh, there was. was. Okay. It's very, very authentic. Uh, feels right. so Star Wars when you see a hammerhead. And, it, you know, something I love that George Lucas did was he was able to incorporate all of his classic original trilogy designs into the prequel trilogy with new designs. And it really just uh, made the whole galaxy feel like the same place. And uh, I, I yep. wish I we yep. you know we've talked about this time and time again on the show. I know a lot of people listening to the show feel the same as as we do. But man, we would sure like to see some of that original aesthetic, alien aesthetic return to the sequel trilogy and beyond. We just need to you know I I, I get it, Disney guys. You need to uh, you know Neil Scanlon. You need to show us that hey you know. I'm as good as Rick Baker or whatever. <laughs> I'm as good. I'm as good as uh, who is the old guy who uh, sculpted Yoda? Stuart Freeborn. I'm as good as yeah. Stuart Freeborn. Look at me. Okay, we get that, but like you know, throw in some of that old stuff. Uh, you know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it's, it on home. Bring it on home. Now the other thing we saw was a, a Tie Interceptor, which. Uh, was being piloted by a character that I think is going to be sort of the... Is this sort of the Red Baron of the Star Wars universe? <laughs> right, well, he's flying a crimson tie. Interesting yeah. that we see that tie flying through hyperspace. Have we ever seen a TIE fighter fly through hyperspace in any well, Star Wars medium? Well, I, I thought that the Interceptor had that ability. That's what made it unique. I don't think so. I, no? I, I the, the Empire never equipped their TIE fighters... With hyperdrives. Well, the regular ones. Except yeah. for Vader's. I, did, I think we may have seen Vader's tie cut through hyperspace. No, in Rebels. So. In Rebels. Oh, in Rebels. Oh, in Rebels. Mm. I think it did in Rebels. In yeah. Rebels. In the first episodes. But I thought it was so striking to see that Crimson Tie Interceptor flying through hyperspace. I, yeah. I, I, I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. did we ever see that before? That crossed my mind. Hmm. Uh, okay, so I think we got this uh, sort of Red Baron character. Uh, obviously, General Leia Organa, Poe Dameron, BB-8. I was surprised that uh, BB-8 stuck with Kaz, that he actually, you know, Poe leaves and leaves BB-8 sort of uh, kind of watching over him. Mm-hmm. I mean, if y- you get the tightness between Poe and BB-8, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to leave you here. So it seems as though... Uh, Poe's going to be dropping, I would think, dropping back in from time to time, or at least be some sort of hollow communications between the two. Jim, you've, you, you're two episodes ahead. Uh, does Poe come back yet? No, no. In, in the two episodes no I've seen after the recruit were the triple dark and fuel for the fire. And no, uh, there is no appearance of, uh, of Poe Dameron in either of those episodes. And, and uh, General Leia, we have not heard... General Leia at all. We we saw her in the recruit uh, right. via hologram, but we haven't um, actually had any dialogue from Leia. We haven't heard uh, anything from Hype 
Faison, which is played by uh, the actor Donald Faison. And uh, I thought it was really curious as I paid close attention to the closing credits. Anthony Daniels is C-3PO. You do hear Anthony Daniels' voice uh, in the first episode. You do? Oh, yeah. When, when, uh, when Poe is there with the General uh, Leia hologram, you hear uh, 3PO in the background talking to her. You do? I, yeah. I did not oh. notice that. Yeah, yeah. So Anthony Daniels uh, is reprising his role as, our, as C-3PO. Okay, so Anthony Daniels, uh, once you know it, he found a way to get into the latest <laughs> Star Wars spinoff. Uh, you know, and, and that's his thing. You know, he's in every Star Wars anything. And, yeah. But I, I think that gives us promise that we'll actually see 3PO and maybe even R2. Will we see R2? No, I guess at this period of time, R2 is shut down. And yes. he, has, he has a sheet over him and he's just there <laughs> like, you know, just like scrap, you know, in, in the uh, hangar there, just... You know, is- a, there, you know what? There's another plot thread that <laughs> Ryan Johnson completely ignored yeah. in The Last Jedi. <laughs> yeah. What the heck was R2? You got one of the most important characters in the entire Star Wars saga, R2-D2, and he's he's tarped, you know, like the uh, like the like the sports car in yep. the in the garage. Hey, listen, this is J.J. Abrams' mess to begin with. Let him clean it up. OK. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, oh, the blockade runner. That was really cool to see the uh, was, Corellian yeah. Corvette. And I love that, you know, that scene where Poe's talking about, you know, a lot of action all the way from, uh, you know, mentioning uh, Scarif Scarif. all the way up to Jack Who. Yeah. Of course, it goes back further than that. It actually goes back to the, uh, the days just post Clone Wars days. Right. Right. But I mean, that indicates to you that it's the Tantive. Because it's the same ship from the Battle of Scarif. Mm-hmm. That that has to be the exact same ship we see at the beginning of A New Hope. Yep. Yeah, that was cool. I mean, even when the ships have a cameo, that's that's pretty cool. Um, someone said, oh, this is something I completely missed. You can see in the back of Aunt Z's Tavern oh, what, on the Colossus. What, the, oh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, the, uh, the Blockade Runner. Is that the first mention of the Refresher? In a Star Wars, <laughs> did we get that again? The yes, refresher. he. Uh, Kaz asks about the refresh. Just show me the way to the refresher. Oh, okay, he says to the droids. And where can uh, I get a cup of calf on the way there? <laughs> he really should have. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that is that is the first audible first outside of a novel. Star Wars ca- yeah, characters Re- asked to go to the gym. refresher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've had we've had other. Uh, requests for the facilities yeah. in the past. Yeah, I think we have. I mean, in the Clone Wars, right? Somebody needs to use a refresher at some point. It's just when you're dealing with so many diverse alien species, how big must that bathroom possibly be? It's going you know? oh. to accommodate a lot. It's yeah. Gotta, yeah, it's like, oh, you know. You, you, imagine you, imagine going into the stall after Grumgar has sat there. <laughs> well, you probably see a bunch 20. of crushed porcelain <laughs> in a pile there and like water <laughs> leaking everywhere. Really? Oh, my God. I never thought about that. Wow. A bathroom in the Star Wars universe. Wow. Right. You'd have to have a lot of reinforced things. You'd have to have like a lot of triple, quadruple shooters. See, this shooters. is exactly why they never mention it. I mean, do we want to be. Think, I mean, think about it. Look at how much thought has to go into just that one little thing. Oh, my gosh. Um. All right, Aunt Z's Tavern on the Colossus. Uh, you do see in the background. I didn't catch this, but you do see a Mandalorian helmet on a shelf ah, behind her. Oh, I didn't see that. Good. Just sitting on the shelf. It's on the shelf. On the. That's a that's a sim- <laughs> symbolic of George's scripts for the live action TV show. It's all right there. Uh, now, Jim, I think you mentioned all of these. These are the alien creatures that you see. Uh, a, a Biff, a Snaggletooth, a Sullustan, a Godel, an Arcona, and, of course, there are several more that you, you mentioned. But uh, did you mention the um, – oh, it was just on the tip of my tongue. Um, and I lost it. 
There's, I lost it. There's a Nemoidian that shows up in the uh, second episode. second episode. Yeah. Ooh, and there's a of course uh, there's a Nikto as one of the lead Nick characters Toe. and yeah. a Cabe and a Cabe. Yeah, a Cabe. Or- yes, Orca's Cabe. Cabe. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Um. Oh, this is interesting. There is a poster of a Kowakian monkey lizard. Uh, this is in the. Uh, in uh, Aunt, Aunt Z's tavern. Cabe and was then, a, a, a Chadra fan, by the way. That's a Cabe oh, okay. species is a Chadra fan. We'll be talking about that. You'll see it on the third week in our syllabus for uh, Star Wars <laughs> Aliens. Somebody give me a grant, please. I want to teach this class, and I'll podcast it, too. Oh, how about the tattoos? What's, what's the uh, the tough guy's name? Again, uh, we don't. What is his name? I don't know. I need to pull up a cast list because a lot of these people don't get identified no. during the show. The fish guy. Yes, no, the guy that the guy that. No, the, the, yes, he's he he has he works in the marketplace and he sells the fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that yeah, the one that ca- wants to beat up Kaz. The Gorgs got hit by the dark by the dart. Gorgs. Oh, I thought it was. A- I thought it was cool to see that dart plane is alive and well in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> that is nice. That uh, is nice. We did see a, a version before. of pool being played in uh, the outtakes from A New Hope when Luke goes to Anchorhead. The gang oh. is all gathered oh, around right. this uh, weird pool table. Well, this guy, he's got a uh, tattoo of a rancor on his uh, on his bicep. <laughs> yes, he does. He has several tattoos. I, I noted, there, of course, the uh, symbol of the black sun. Yep. Is represented yep. there. It, it, last time we saw that tattoo was on uh, Zero the Hut's big belly. Hello there. <laughs> he also has a Rathtar. A Rath- he oh. has a Rathtar and a space slug. And a space slug. Well, that, you know, that covers all the bases right there. You yeah, put the four right. together, and that's one hell of a party. <laughs> so either that or a great comedy <laughs> troupe. You know? yeah, Let's hit the oh, road, the- fellas. The pit droids, they were fun to see. Pit droids, mm-hmm. yeah. And another thing that kind of just brings us back into that Star Wars universe. You see the pit droids, that's immediate recognition of something that's symbolic of the universe itself on a whole. And I love to see that synergy. I, I don't care if it's prequel, sequel, original, animated. However you can do it to bring it all together, I think, is something that the fans want. And finally, you get a reference of, uh, oh, wait a minute. Got two more here. Uh, the, the Corellian hyperfuel is mentioned. Oh, yeah, the coaxium. The coaxium. Right, right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that actually comes into play in the third episode oh. with uh, Elijah Wood's character. And last but not least, uh, and Jim, you mentioned the Starkiller base has a cameo. So you actually mm. get to see Starkiller base animated. In the series, of course, we know what happens to that. But any background is welcome, and yeah. in something that's really easy to watch and get into, like Star Wars Resistance. Yeah, I know it's a kid show, but it really does a, a, I think, a very refreshing job of presenting new elements into the Star Wars canon, and it it takes its time. There's no frantic pace to this show which is something Mm. I really appreciate and something Mm. that I feel like is often a lost art when it comes to presenting animated content of any sort. It seems like everything is that my kids watch is so rapid fire and insane that I welcome a much slower, easygoing approach. And I think you get that with Star Wars Resistance. I I agree. I agree. I I was afraid that it was going to be real frantic. Now, I mean, some of the feedback... Uh, that we've seen and that has been sort of leveled at the show is that they say that it's kind of a hyperactive, you know, very modern uh, anime style. I didn't really get that at all. Um, but there is there's a story over on io9 by a uh, German Lussier and uh, the headline, please let Star Wars resistance tell its own story. And I thought this quote was interesting. He says, fans shouldn't expect every new piece of Star Wars 
to fill in gaps from other Star Wars projects. I'm as guilty as the next person when it comes to wanting that type of thing. But then I look back at the Star Wars stuff I love the most. None of it is there to fill gaps. It moves forward, giving us new and exciting characters on their own adventures. So he's saying uh, he hopes that the show uses some restraint and allows these characters to tell their own story rather than worry about contributing uh, to canon. Yes. Uh, I think there's a balance there, but you know what? Part of me says, look, um, if they didn't, if, if canon didn't matter, they wouldn't have uh, spent so much time letting everybody know that this takes place six months before The Force Awakens. But then I think about my own kids. You know, I, my, my six year old, my 10 year old, uh, they looked at the show and they weren't worried about when it took place. Yeah. They're not trying to put it in, in any kind of canonical order. That's what those, us old people do. Right. Well, you know, it's it's weird. It, I've noted the evolution of Star Wars over these past 40 years. And somehow it went from being a thing about friendship and achieving your highest potential and overcoming the odds. That stuff to me was always the priority of Star Wars. Now it's become like focused on expanding the mythology or the political edge, all that other stuff that that's minutia. Those are blanks that could be filled in in any number of mediums, comics, novels, even audio dramas, what have you. It doesn't need to be right there in the theatrical release or even on the big screen or even on the small screen. It doesn't matter. Push the story forward. Characters, friendships, overcoming the odds. That's Star Wars. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, well, I, I agree. That's uh, you know, kind of that's kind of what I was getting at with that Mandalorian stuff. It's like he, it 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 shouldn't be burdened with having to explain all the Mandalorian uh, gaps and 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 you know try to fit this character into the history of what happened to them and everything. It just you know the most important thing is going to be that they develop characters that are interesting, uh, whose uh, their own, their unique stories you can invest in, and you find out these other things kind of slowly. They're they're just uh, they become compelling, and then you want to know. Um, you, you know they can't they can't just throw the kitchen sink at you to begin with and expect you to care. It, right, it's it has to be organically woven into whatever that character story is, because ultimately it's going to be the 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 individual character that we're going to be interested in. That we're that sure. we're going to care about. I mean, if if their whole existence is to serve the overall story or to tie up loose ends from another story that's already been told, I think it's going to fall short because it's it's it, it has to be its own it, thing. Right. I think at that, that point it that becomes guy, very predictable, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, if yeah, if everything is just filler material. To what we already know, it's going to be uh, pretty weak. Mm -hmm. And I, but I mean, I like and I like the uh, I like the, I like having the perspective. Some of those larger, you know, where does this character fit into the larger picture? But I, I, I you know, you can you could do that somewhat slowly. I, I just I guess the point is is that you don't want the uh, story to become slave to all those things. Um, it's just, it should develop organically where you want to know the histories and the, you know, their place and what, 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 what these characters think about all this other stuff, you know, you, you don't care about those things at first. You're just getting to know them. Well, right. I mean, there, that's something that has been, uh, really fun to see when it happens is, you know, we, we were all very aware of what was going on between the rebellion and the empire, but it was it was rebels that kind of gave us that glimpse of what life was really like uh, living under the tyrannical rule of the empire. You, you remember in that first season they had uh, uh, the, the big holiday where they were all you know forced to celebrate um, you know, the glory of the empire, and uh, those were really great. Uh, glimpses of the stuff that you would you know you wouldn't see necessarily in a in a in a feature Star Wars film. 
that round it out nicely. Yeah, it becomes intriguing. It's it's just it's woven in, you know. I mean, it's like yeah. I mean, going back to the original movie. I mean, with Luke. I mean, they're very they're just very little things that he does that 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 tells you so much about him. You know, like I, I it's not that I like the Empire. I hate it, but there's nothing I could do about it right now. I mean, that tells you. A, That's all you a need lot. to know. That's all <laughs> you need to know. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, you know, it's it's kind of refreshing and. I mean, very much a breath of fresh air to to have a, a Star Wars uh, story being told on such a tiny, small level. And that's where I think that instead of propelling the canon forward, instead of propelling the mythology forward, it just will propel characters and relationships and, and, and place it within the universe and make it something that... Families can watch together. Kids can watch and understand. And it'll probably end up being a great gateway for younger fans to get into Star Wars and say, God, I want to more, know more about this. I want to see those old movies my dad's always talking about now. So that would be great if, if the show could do that. Is there a lot of meat on the bones for adult fans like us who really do th- take things like the mythology seriously probably not uh we aren't going to be doing weekly you know side shows uh based on this and uh i i I think that's the right decision to make considering that next year we're going to be getting several different star wars series and films coming our way we can't do you know spin-off shows for the the mandalorian and for the return of the clone wars and for star wars resistance and then with episode nine showing up at the end of the year me and swank will go insane so (laughs) and i know that would be very entertaining for a lot of you guys to hear and some of you guys probably think you've been hearing that for years now but uh but we're just gonna keep it nice and tight and talk about it here in the show and uh Maybe we'll have some friends join us when we talk about resistance. Uh, but for the most part, we'll do everything we can to keep you on top of everything happening in the Star Wars Resistance universe and beyond. You know, I'm sensing a little bit of deception here.